Hello and welcome to the fourth lecture podcast in the Sheridan College General Arts and Science core course Intersections of World History. We're now in unit four which is actually starting off the second module of the course which will take us all the way up to the year 1300 CE which is smack dab in the middle of the Middle Ages. In this unit, unit four, we're going to be looking at and comparing early civilizations in Africa and in the Americas. In the Americas, we're going to be looking at the Maya civilization and the Nazca civilization in South America. In Africa, we're going to take a look at the great civilizations of Aksum and Kush, both of which, in my opinion, don't get the respect that they deserve for their incredible contributions to human history. So we've got lots of really cool, interesting stuff to cover today, so let's jump right in. The learning objectives for this lecture podcast are, number one, understand the development of agriculture and the spread of villages in Africa and the Americas. Number two, describe the kingdoms of Kush and Aksum and their importance to African history. Number three, understand the spread of Bantu culture and village life in sub-Saharan Africa. Number four, describe and compare the civilizations of the Maya, the Moche, and the Nazca. And finally, number five, assess how the development of agriculture and villages follows similar patterns around the world. So I want to first turn back to the cradle of humanity itself, to Africa, and we're going to take a look at how um, first farming and agricultural communities developed and how um, in particular how the Sahara Desert really determines how the history of Africa plays out because the Sahara Desert is large just take a look at it it is the uh, in fact the third largest desert in the world if we're including Antarctica and the Arctic but it is the largest hot desert it's what most people think of when you think of a desert although it's not all sand everywhere um, but that is a large part of it of course the Sahara Desert though um, hasn't always been the way that it is today and in fact for many millennia, millennia the Sahara was relatively hospitable um, with uh, areas of, of savannas and steppes these are areas of grassland um, and these favorable conditions, if we look at this is maybe what the Sahara Desert would have looked like about 10,000 years ago, uh, this um, really uh, made it favorable for um, the move from hunter gathering to agriculture. And so certainly in human history, we lived in a time where the Sahara Desert was a much nicer place to be in. The Sahara Desert has been cycling every 20,000 years or so from being a wetter, nicer place to being the dry desert that we know today. And it has to do with the tilt of the Earth's axis and really where the North African monsoon is. But approximately 4,000 years ago, uh, the monsoon rains shifted eastward and the desert expanded to roughly what it is today. And then this really creates the later patterns of settlement. And so just like other places in the world that we've talked about, settlement in Africa really um, begins along the Nile River. River valleys are essential and they're definitely essential when outside of that narrow strip of green going down the Nile River, it's all desert. So the, on the Nile River, um, there's two basic regions that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, the northern part of the Nile, uh, or what we think of as downstream on the Nile, is uh, referred to as Egypt. And as we go upstream in the Nile, that is usually called the region of Nubia. And we see several civilizations which developed on the Nile River Valley. Um, in particular, we have the Egyptian kingdom, which we talked briefly about in a previous lecture podcast. We're going to be talking a little bit more about it today. Uh, and what we are going to be talking much more about, and that is the kingdom of the Kush and the kingdom of Aksum. And all of these kingdoms would have a profound influence on not only the history of Africa, but really the history of the world itself. In the rest of Africa, the existence of the Sahara Desert meant that we see the push towards agriculture moving southward from where it first developed. And we see um, the rest of Africa develop villages that fit into uh, one of the three major ecological zones that the rest of Africa is made up with. Uh, so either um, uh, rainforest, or savanna. Savanna 
is um, uh, the best place for agriculture and it's where the majority of villages will be concentrated in Africa. Savannah is um, basically a mixed woodland and grassland. So there are trees, but the trees aren't close enough together that the canopy, that is the top of the trees, um, covers uh, the ground. Um, there tends to be seasonal um, variability in terms of, of rain, but it is the best area within these three ecosystems for farming and so consequently we'll see the most amount of people in sub-saharan africa that that is the area below the sahara desert uh, living in savannah however um, uh, rainforest agriculture was um, uh, practiced as well and also we see agriculture uh, to a more limited extent uh, also practiced on the steppe and steppe is basically a more arid form of a savanna there's less rain although there still is rain um, and there are still trees but m way fewer trees the trees tend to be concentrated closer to sources of of water and so these are the three main regions of africa south of the sahara desert and in each of those areas we'll see a different development of agriculture but first let's now take a look uh, back at the Nile Valley because this is where the earliest great civilizations of Africa will appear. So like all other civilizations, civilization in Africa begins along a river, the river valley of the Nile, the Great Nile River. So normally we separate the regions of the Nile um, as upstream, it's usually referred to as Nubia and downstream is referred to as Egypt. The word Nubia actually comes from the Egyptian language itself and means uh, land of, of gold because the region was one of the main sources for the gold trade uh, throughout the ancient world. Now the earliest evidence for agriculture comes from the area of the Middle Nile around what is now modern day Sudan. And archaeological finds there have shown that in the region of the Nile a culture of raising cattle and cultivating a grass called sorghum which is a cereal grain uh, domesticated very similar in some ways to barley and wheat and also distinctive uh, pottery in the region beginning around 4000 BCE we start to see villages and chieftains peppering the Nile all the way along and over time, uh, through archaeology, we can start to see distinctive cultures really appearing. Um, so we certainly have a cultural area emerging that we might think of as distinctively Egyptian and a culture area in uh, the Nubian region, which is usually referred to as the Kerma culture area, um, which is named after one of the ancient cities that would develop there called Kerma. It's sometimes also referred to as the Kush cultural area because eventually that region will be known as the Kingdom of Kush. Between 3500 and 3100 BCE, writing begins to appear in this region. And here you see some of the earliest forms of Egyptian hieroglyphics. Uh, Upper and Lower Egypt are unified into a single kingdom around 3100 BCE. So from this point onward, we can start to talk about Egypt proper. Now, I introduced you to Egypt already in a previous lecture podcast, so we're not going to go into too much detail about Egypt today, uh, but we're going to be talking more about uh, the southern uh, kingdoms um, uh, which were neighboring to and, and contemporaneous to Egypt uh, that existed in the region of Nubia. Around 1500 BCE, Egypt expanded and took over the region of Nubia with all the different cultures and villages that were in that area. Um, and Egypt reached its sort of a greatest sort of territorial uh, height at that point in time. So I want to take a closer look at what I call the culture of Kerma or the culture of Kush. So even though the culture of Kerma was overrun by the Egyptians in 3100 BCE, when the Egyptians took over that region, the culture itself continued to flourish. And in many ways, it defined the political and cultural landscape of northeastern Africa for more than a thousand years. Here you see some examples of their artwork and their pottery. Uh, 
the culture of Kerma is flourishing in what nowadays would be considered modern day Sudan. And we can distinguish it somewhat from other ancient cultures in that it seems to have been a primarily a rural culture, in certainly in comparison to Egypt, um, as the city of Kerma, for which it is named, only had about 2,000 residents in it, which even by ancient standards is pretty small. There were um, rich gold mines in the area. That was what Nubia, the whole region of Nubia, was known for. Bronze weapons and tools um, were um, commonly made in this region. And it was also an area through which trade came, particularly ivory and ebony wood from sub-Saharan Africa. The other thing to keep in mind, and that is that the Kerma culture and the Egyptian cultures influenced one another constantly. They were constantly intertwined and really one can't understand Egypt without understanding the culture of Kerma and the later Kingdom of Kush. And you can't understand the Kingdom of Kush without understanding Egypt because those two cultures developed in parallel with one another. When we look at intersections between Egyptian and Kushite cultures or the Kerma culture, uh, we definitely see that the two cultures did see themselves and see each other uh, in distinctive ways and not and they're not necessarily the same so for example um, in Egyptian art Kushites or people from southern uh, the southern part of the Nile um, from Nubia are usually depicted with darker skin and with a cropped hairstyle on the other hand when Kushites depict themselves they usually depict themselves wearing animal skin cloaks um, pattern fabrics and very large earrings very distinctive compared to the way Egyptians were dressing in terms of transportation, the Egyptians uh, preferred to use the chariot, at least their kings preferred to use uh, chariots, whereas Kushites, um, when their leaders are depicted, they're much more likely to be depicted as actually riding the horses themselves. So here's an example of how Nubians are sometimes depicted in Egyptian art. This is a wall painting that was ordered uh, to be constructed by the Pharaoh Ramses II uh, around 1300 BCE in uh, Nubia in a temple. And it was to commemorate the conquering of Nubia and the adding of it to Egypt. And so here you see the Nubians depicted with darker skin and also wearing animal skins. This is an image from uh, the tomb of Hui, uh, the Egyptian governor of Nubia during the reign of King Tutankhamun um, around 1336 BCE. And it pictures uh, Nubians bringing gifts, a uh, tribute to uh, Egypt's pharaoh. And again, you can see how they're depicted um, in contrast to the Egyptians themselves. They're being depicted uh, with elements of dress such as ostrich feathers or panther or um, uh, and also they have a um, uh, different hairstyle compared to the Egyptians. So certainly culturally, they're each seeing each other very differently. But things came full circle for the Kushite people, as often is the case. By 750 BCE, civil war had divided Egypt into little local kingdoms, and so there was no unified Egypt. And during that time, the Kushite king, Pionke, was able to unify his own people, and in 732, he conquered the Egyptian capital of Memphis, and as such, he established a new dynasty of pharaohs over Egypt, the 25th dynasty, um, which was the Kush dynasty. And so for about a hundred years or so, the Kush controlled all of Egypt and the kingdom of Kush and Egypt were united once again, but this time with a different group in control. Uh, we don't know what Pionke looked like, unfortunately, but he did produce um, a stele, a, um, a stone uh, uh, slab that chronicled the victory. And you can see um, the writing behind uh, there on the left hand side of your screen. So let's talk a little bit more about the 25th dynasty of pharaohs, the dynasty of Kush. The Kushite rulers who came into power after Pionke's invasion presented themselves as pharaohs who could return Egypt to its former glory. And indeed, for about a hundred years, Kushite pharaohs provided a relatively stable government. There were attempts to revive state religion even, and even to expand the empire to the east. 
However, all things must come to an end, and after about 100 years, around 664 BCE, the neighboring and powerful Assyrian Empire invaded Egypt from the north, and this went very badly for the Kushite pharaoh Tatamani, who was forced to retreat first from Thebes, then to Napata, and then further south, all the way to the southern Kushite city of Meroe. And Meroe would become the new seat of the Kush government as the kingdom of Kush and Egypt once again went on separate paths as the Kushites would no longer be in control of Egypt. And in fact, from that point onward, the Assyrians now in control of Egypt attempted to destroy any traces of the 25th dynasty, much to the chagrin of historians trying to figure out exactly what happened because they spent a good part of their first few years in control of Egypt by destroying all of the statues of the Kush pharaohs, uh, their steles, and even um, uh, scratching their names from the historic record. I mean, quite literally scratching them off the walls. So although the Syrian invasion ended Kushite control over Egypt, it certainly didn't end the story of the kingdom of the Kush. And in many ways, the later kingdom of the Kush is the most fascinating. So after uh, their period of ruling Egypt, Meroe became the new capital of the kingdom of the Kush. Meroe, of course, is an ancient city. And so sometimes you'll even um, here it referred to as the kingdom of Meroe rather than the kingdom of Kush. Both of those terms essentially mean the same thing. Kush influence continued to expand uh, into the savannah south of the Sahara and they really controlled trade uh, for miles and miles around. Now as historians uh, are trying to learn more and more about the kingdom of the Kush, we are hampered by the fact that although the Kushites had their own unique language and script, it hasn't entirely been fully deciphered. So we don't uh, we don't know what it says entirely. Uh, that being said, there's still a lot we can say about the culture um, and society of the Kush, which is still quite interesting. For one thing, women were very powerful in Kush society, relatively speaking, compared to other ancient peoples. For instance, they practiced a matrilineal succession. That is, the power of kings came not through the father, but through the mother. And as such, there were often female rulers, warrior queens known as Kandakes. This is actually the root of the uh, female name Candace today. Um, there's one Kandake that really bears mentioning just because she is super cool, uh, and that is Kandake Amanirenes. So a Kandake Amanirenes uh, was leading the Kush when the Romans, and the Romans we're going to be talking about in much more detail next week, but the Roman Empire had taken over Egypt. And this is a massive empire um, right next door to the kingdom of the Kush. And you know, the very fact that the kingdom of the Kush decided to go against the Roman Empire shows you just how courageous uh, Amani Reines was. She led uh, Kushite armies north against the Romans in a war that lasted for five years between 27 and 22 BCE. She won many victories and after one victory, they uh, she ordered her troops to saw off the head of a statue of the Roman Emperor um, Augustine. And then she had that head of the statue brought back um, home to Kush and had it buried in the ground uh, at the entrance to a temple so that the Kushite people would be walking on the head of the Roman em Emperor every time they went into the capital. Now that is, that's just pretty cool. You don't really wanna mess with her, I would think. So the Kush also built pyramids as well. So here you see uh, an image from the famous Nubian pyramids uh, in Meroe, in the Meroe archeological site. Uh, and they served as tombs for the kings and queens and wealthy citizens of Meroe and other uh, Kushite cities. And they were built um, approximately 800 years after the Egyptians stopped building their pyramids. So it's a completely separate phenomenon, although obviously influenced by the Egyptians. More than 50 of these ancient pyramids and ro royal tombs um, have been found in the desert sands at Meroe. So the kingdom of Kush flourished with its capital at Meroe for centuries, but eventually everything does come to an end. And really some of this can be traced back to when the Roman Empire invaded 
and conquered Egypt to the north. So we're going to be talking much more, obviously, about the Romans next week. Um, but with Rome firmly in control of the north, things were different for the kingdom of Cush. And this is despite the exploits of Kandike Amani Reines um, and her you know, victories against Rome. Despite all that, she wasn't able to push Rome out of Egypt, and Rome was there to stay. And uh, with Rome firmly in control of trade in the north, it meant that the kingdom of Cush lost much of its preeminence. Nevertheless, um, the kingdom of Cush existed probably for another 300 years or so. Uh, the eventual decline, historians proposed various reasons, which we could probably categorize into three. The first is that there was probably an exhaustion of the local supply of wood uh, for burning because iron production was so central to the Kush economy and to produce iron you need to produce really really hot fires and to do that you need wood and it seems that uh, the forests were likely exhausted um, by the time we get into the second or third century CE. There also were increasing raids from the late 200s BCE from nomadic peoples in the deserts east of the Nile. And the third reason was the increasing economic power of the Ethiopian highlands next door, which really is going to lead us to our next topic, which is the Kingdom of Axum, but more on that in a moment. Meroe would be eventually invaded and sacked by that same kingdom of Axum around 350 CE, bringing to an end the glorious history of the kingdom of Cush. But where one story ends, another begins, and now we will turn to the kingdom of Axum. Okay, so let's talk about the rise of the kingdom of Axum now. So you see Axum there in the Ethiopian highlands, just to the east of the kingdom of Cush. So naturally the rise of Axum was going to have probably a negative effect on the Cush. They would come to dominate the same trade that at one point in time the Cushites controlled. But let's step a little bit further back in time before Cush and before Axum at all. So that region, um, was known by the Egyptians as the land of the Punt, uh, and it was an important source of gold for the Egyptians in ancient times. The kingdom of Axum itself was founded in 100 CE in what is now Ethiopia and Eritrea along the Red Sea. The center of the empire was the city of Axum in the Ethiopian highlands. Now, this is a very strategic location. Many ancient people would have had to have interacted with the people of Axum because on one side, essentially, you have the Roman Empire and Axum would be the gateway, the conduit through which trade from India and ultimately China would flow through to the Roman Empire. And the way that it did this is because ships would um, find that the quickest route coming from India would be to come up through the Red Sea to unload their goods, and thus Axum then necessarily becomes the middleman for all of this ancient trade. It became so important that um, we have a contemporary source. The great Persian prophet Manny described Axum at the time as one of the great civilizations of the world, one of the great four civilizations alongside Persia, Rome, and China. The kingdom would become a major power in the trade route between Rome and India. Now, there is one other little side note of interest about that region, and that is that it is also perhaps the birthplace of coffee in the uh, Ethiopian highlands there. And coffee, well, coffee is incredibly important to human history, and we're going to be talking a lot about it in a later podcast, so I'll just leave it hanging for now. Um, and also, really, when Axum had its glory days, coffee was not a major factor. So um, we'll still put it aside for now, but coffee, nevertheless, we're going to be talking about it more in the future. Ethiopian highlands, super important. So let's talk more now about Axum. The kingdom of Axum spoke a language called Gez. Now, Gez is a Semitic language, which is part of the same family as Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic. It's no longer a spoken language today, but it actually is still around as a liturgical language, as a written language. That is um, a language that is used for written religious texts today in Ethiopia. Here's an example again of the Gez uh, Semitic script. This is a, a much more recent version. I think this is uh, from about 500 years ago, but it still gives you a sense of what the written language would have looked like. 
One of the other things about Axum that's really important from a historical point of view is that Axum was one of the very first places where Christianity gained a major foothold. Uh, King Ezana uh, adopted Christianity officially as the religion of the, of the kingdom in 333 CE, and this made Axum only the third Christian kingdom in the world after Armenia and Georgia at that point in time. Uh, the kingdom of Axum is also famous for its monumental stone monoliths called Stella, and here you see an example of one in Axum itself. Uh, the kingdom expanded its borders quite a bit. It expanded across the Red Sea and into the Arabian Peninsula, conquering the region of Himyar, which is basically modern day Yemen and Somalia. And Axum, in doing so, became an empire of sorts. Um, by the mid fourth century, it reached its height and it also began to use the name of Ethiopia rather than Axum. Now, the etymology of the name Ethiopia is something that there is quite a bit of debate, whether it's um, named from uh, one of the ancient kings of the Axum region or whether it is uh, actually uh, derived from uh, a Greek uh, phrase. But regardless of how the uh, word came to be, it does start to be used as the name of that region in the mid fourth century. However, as the Persian Empire, which again we'll be talking about the Persian Empire next week, began to become more prominent, eventually this caused Axum to decline. And it's a very similar story to what happened to the Kush, that as the Persians took over control of the trade, Axum no longer had uh, the same power. It didn't have the same uh, reason for being. By 600 CE, Axum had shrunk quite a bit and was really playing a much more regional uh, role and eventually it would um, pretty much cease to exist uh, by the 8th century or so. So we've talked about the great African civilizations that emerged along the Nile and along the Red Sea, but what was going on with the rest of the continent? So let's go back to what we talked about at the beginning of this lecture podcast, and that is the importance of the Sahara Desert in determining where human populations uh, can go. And because the Sahara Desert essentially makes the entire northern part of Africa really inhospitable. We see the development of agriculture and the um, movement of culture and people really moving towards the south. And we have these different eological zones that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture podcast as well. And we talked about how village life adapted to those three ecological zones, those being the steppe, the savanna, and the rainforest. Out of those three, it's the savanna that has the largest populations and the most prominent village life, although we see the existence of farming and village life in all three of those ecological zones. And by 600 BCE, agricultural and pastoralism, that is the raising of domestic animals, was common not only in East Africa, but in West Africa also. And it's during this time period that we begin to see the spread of the great Bantu language and culture. So Bantu languages uh, comprises several hundred indigenous ethnic groups in Africa. And today it's spread over a vast area from Central Africa to Southeast Africa to Southern Africa. And this um, can be traced back to this, the spread of this culture and these languages can be traced back to this time. And it was moving throughout the continent, bringing not only the language and culture, but also bringing the practice of farming, the practice of raising domestic animals, and thus changing the way of life just about everywhere in Africa. And that's one thing that we can say. Um, farming pretty much displaced hunting and gathering everywhere in the continent of Africa. Only a very few foraging groups remain, such as the Bushmen in Southern Africa. But for the most part, what we see is farming and village life everywhere in Africa. Um, and then there's one other thing that we should say about the story of the rest of Africa before we move on. And that is one of those intersections of world history. So in our last lecture podcast, we talked about how the adventurous Austronesian people um, had been branching out with their new sailing technology and began to explore Pacific islands, um, uh, branching off from Southeast Asia. And some of them 
didn't go towards the Pacific. Some of them went the other direction and they began to explore um, to the west and they landed in uh, the island of Madagascar off the coast of Africa over here. And that w they would have been setting up the very first human colonies there. And between 200 and 500 BCE, Austronesians reached Africa itself and began to settle. And they brought with them things that Africa had never seen. For example, they brought with them bananas. Bananas were a really easy crop to grow in many places in Africa. So it was a great crop to be brought to Africa. They also brought with them chickens. Chickens had been domesticated, we think, perhaps in Thailand, uh, maybe India, around 5000 BCE, but they certainly hadn't ever been in Africa and uh, pigs as well. So the introduction of chickens and pigs and bananas would completely change farming culture um, for uh, many positive reasons for the uh, peoples of Africa. And it also marks, once again, one of those strange and interesting intersections of world history. There is no place in the world that is completely isolated from everywhere else for all time. Intersections continue to happen. Okay, so we have talked about Africa now. We've talked about the development of the uh, farming communities along the Nile, uh, which turned into chieftains and eventually the kingdoms of Egypt and Kush and an Aksum. We've also talked about how um, farming and pastoralism spread throughout the rest of the continent of Africa, changing um, the way people lived pretty much everywhere. So now let's go back to the Americas and compare and contrast and see how different cultures there followed nevertheless very similar paths. So let's first take a look at Mesoamerica. So a quick recap of what we talked about last week. Mesoamerica is the region of Central America. Um, the modern countries that would correspond to it are, you can see them on the map here, Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, etc. And they're outlined in red. This is where we can find some of the earliest evidence for farming and settlements in the Americas. By 3000 BCE, farming was firmly established in this region. Uh, people were farming corn, squash, beans, that sort of thing. They weren't only farming though, they were likely still hunting and farming only formed part of their diet. We don't see evidence for permanent settlements until around 1800 BCE, but then things start to move pretty quickly after that and we begin to see um, the rise of larger cities. But just like we saw elsewhere, for instance, in Africa, in Nubia or in Egypt, when these cities or these chiefdoms arise, they're not part of larger kingdoms or empires yet. They're still independent. They share culture with neighboring regions, but they aren't joining up with one another. They're independent chieftains. And the first cultural group that we learned about um, last week was the Olmec, who flourished between 1500 and 400 BCE. One of the most important archaeological sites for the Olmec is at San Lorenzo, and I've uh, put it on the map there on the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the Olmec, of course, are known for their very large colossal heads and also the fact that they're really quite mysterious. We know so little about them because we haven't yet been able to decipher their language. Now, I want to talk about another archaeological site, um, uh, which is south of San Lorenzo. It's close to the modern day Mexican and Guatemalan border, and that is Izapa. And at Izapa, we have another chiefdom, another um, city which flourished and was culturally important and lasted for uh, quite a bit longer than the Olmec. So let's take a closer look at Izapa. So the city of Azapa flourished from about 600 BCE all the way up to around 100 CEE. And so this is what makes this particular archaeological site so interesting because it would have overlapped with the end of the Olmec culture, but also it would have overlapped with the beginning of the Maya civilization and culture, which of course is a, a major chapter for Mesoamerican history once we get to the Maya. Um, the city of Azapa is based on a single huge temple complex. 
Um, and it's situated close to where we think the earliest examples of cacao production uh, can be found. Now, cacao, of course, is what chocolate is made from. And the Yucatan Peninsula in what is now modern day Mexico, that is the heart of where chocolate we think was first domesticated as a plant and first um, made into a product. So the Azapans would have been some of the very first chocolaholics. Um, they clearly were uh, culturally influential in the region that Azapa existed. And we see very distinctive artwork by the Azapans. And of course, we know that they were great cacao farmers. They also were great traders, regional traders. They might have, in fact, even been one of the first peoples to have used cacao beans as a form of currency. Now, in later Mesoamerican history, cacao beans, the beans that chocolate is made from, um, are uh, the currency. That's the money that is used. That's what the Maya would end up using, and that's what the Aztec would end up using. And then when the Spanish come over, they'll end up having to adopt it in order to trade anything with the indigenous peoples. Uh, so uh, it's possible that the Azapans were the very first people to be using cacao as a uh, some form of currency. We think the population of the city got up into the thousands, which is pretty impressive and yet it still remains an independent entity it's not necessarily part of a larger civilization beyond that we have to turn to the maya to really start to see something much much bigger so north of azapa on the yucatan peninsula would arise the maya civilization and the maya civilization would have a profound effect on not only that region, but also on all the subsequent uh, civilizations which would arise in that area, such as the Aztec. And the Maya people, of course, are still in that region today and their language still persists in that region. So they are incredibly important to history. So let's take a closer look. The Maya, of course, are famous for their great pyramids, which you know, uh, obviously they share in common with cultures in Egypt and Nubia as well. And they built great cities. This is an example of uh, one of their uh, great uh, pyramids, uh, Chichen Itza, the, one of the best preserved examples of Mayan architecture to this day. The Mayans were, of course, great artists as well. Much of their themes are religious, but they also uh, depicted everyday scenes in their art as well, too. The Maya civilization flourished approximately between 250 CE and 900 CE, and they were by far the most important and influential Mesoamerican civilization. They were renowned for their great artists and architects. The Maya also had a fully developed writing systems, which is one of the only Mesoamerican writing systems which has been completely decoded. As a result, we know more about the Maya than practically any other Mesoamerican group with the exception of the Aztecs. Although the Maya wrote on stone, they wrote primarily on a type of bark paper made from tree bark. And unfortunately, this paper was very perishable, which means it doesn't last very long. It decomposes over time. And only a few examples of this bark paper have survived to this day. Although we tend to think of the Maya as a single entity, they were in fact a never a unified people. Each Maya city was technically an independent entity which were linked to each other via trade networks and culture. So this is the pattern that we have been seeing again and again and again in the Neolithic world from China to India to the Middle East to Africa. When we see um, the very first cities appear, they tend to be independent of one another. So just as the Sumerian culture uh, consisted of independent city-states, we saw the same thing happen in China on the Yellow River, and here we see the same thing happening in Mesoamerica. Independent city-states linked via trade and via culture, but otherwise independent from one another. And for the, in the case of the Maya, each state had a different ruler and they would sometimes, in fact, go to war with one another. The Maya built their cities in dense rainforests, and they cleared the surrounding land in order to um, uh, conduct their farming to support their populations. <laughs> 
So we should probably say something about human sacrifice. Now, in this aspect, Maya were not that unusual. Several other uh, major Mesoamerican civilizations and also other civilizations around the world practice uh, human sacrifice. Sacrifices, uh, uh, from the point of view of the, the Maya and others, ensured the prosperity and the survival of the people. They were, in fact, the ultimate gift to the gods. Victims were usually high status prisoners of war. And the most common method of sacrifice was the removal of the heart. And this would take place at the top of those pyramid temples, like the one I just showed you. And as this image depicts, and this is a, an image from a mural at uh, Chichen Itza that was, you know, at that very um, pyramid that I, I showed you, um, the victim would be held down while the priest would cut into his chest while he was still alive and remove the still beating heart. And then the heart would be shown to the people and then the body would be thrown down the steps of the pyramid. Well, in addition to human sacrifice, though, the Maya were also uh, great chocolate uh, fiends. Uh, they were great cacao farmers. One uh, major source which uh, illustrates the importance of chocolate in Maya culture and are depictions of chocolate drinking found on elaborately painted and decorated vases and cups, such as this one. That's what you're actually seeing a close up of is of a vase. And here we see on this vase a ruler being served chocolate on a late Maya vase. Now, chocolate, of course, for the Maya, and in fact, for everyone until we get to about the 19th century was a drink, not a solid thing. Chocolate was drank until really the last 200 years. Um, below the uh, throne is a dish of tamales, which are a traditional Mesoamerican dish made of masa steamed in corn husk. The tamales appear to be covered in some sort of yummy sauce as well. These vases um, and vessels are often found in the burials of wealthy or elite members of Maya culture. However, they also seem to have had practical use as gifts and ceremonial drinking vessels uh, during feasts. Um, but here you, you do so, sort of get a glimmer of uh, some aspects of, of their lives and their love of chocolate. However, all things eventually come to an end, and sometime during the 9th century CE, Maya civilization collapsed. The cities were abandoned and reclaimed by the jungle. Uh, populations likely decreased significantly throughout their territory. The reasons for this collapse are still largely a mystery. No one is entirely sure why Maya society did not continue to thrive. Now, there are some ideas. There's some possible explanations include drought, overpopulation, a foreign invasion of some sort, or even some sort of widespread revolt. However, while the great Maya cities were abandoned and the greater civilization disappeared, the Maya people did not, and their descendants continued to live in the area and they continue to farm cacao. Their culture and language have also persisted in the region right to this day. The Maya number today around 6 million people, making them one of the largest single block of indigenous peoples in the Americas today. So now I want to turn from the Maya and move to South America, to the Andean coast. And I'm going to introduce you to the last three cultures we're going to look at in this lecture podcast. And that is the Moche, the Paracas, and the Nazca. The Moche civilization flourished between 250 and 900 CE. So it really does correspond almost exactly to the same time that the Maya were flourishing as well. Uh, they uh, began on Peru's north coast, which is not a great place for a civilization in some respects because it is very dry, it's very arid, but it has fertile river valleys. And fertile river valleys, as we have come to realize, are pretty much the essential ingredient for civilization. Uh, and consisted, in fact, of several of these desert coast river valleys on what is now modern day Peru's north coast. Like the other groups that you've uh, been introduced to, they were not unified and there was frequent warfare between these cities. Uh, similar to other groups as well, they built, you guessed it, pyramid-like structures, uh, monumental pyramid-like structures which are known locally as wakas. Uh, 
And the uh, wakas, um, they, they aren't entirely like a pyramid. So you can see one of the largest ones over there in the upper left-hand corner. That's uh, the wakas de sol. Uh, the wakas of the sun and and it's it's large and it sort of looks like a pyramid but it's it's not exactly the same thing they grew corn and pulses and cotton and peanuts uh, llamas and alpacas were domesticated for wool and in fact for light transportation and they also were great canal builders given that they were in such a harsh arid dry environment they really had to make good use of directing water to where it was needed um, and so they built large canal irrigation systems um, uh, in order to support their farming systems in an otherwise very inhospitable environment so here's a close-up of that pyramid complex that I just showed you. Uh, this is the La Huaca de Sol. Uh, it was, in fact, part of the largest uh, moche um, site that has been found, about 100 hectares and divided into three sections and bookended by two of these huge pyramids. There's this one, the Huaca de Sol, the Pyramid of the Sun, and then the other one, um, uh, the uh, Huaca de la Luna, the Pyramid of the Moon in the Southeast. And in between them was a sprawling urban center. And at one time, the Huaca de Sol in the Mocha Valley was in fact the largest structure in South America. Uh, so here you see maybe what it might have looked like at the time. So a bustling a temple complex um, with a large urban area between this one and uh, the other one, um, uh, the Huaca de Luna. The Waka were also great metallurgists, so they produced um, really beautiful objects of copper and gold. They knew how to do um, high temperature smelting um, and how to create different alloys and objects uh, made using molds and hammering. Uh, the gold and silver appearance could be achieved by uh, oxidizing and removing the surface coffer from the pieces made with gold or silver alloys. And metal in their society seems to have been a sign of distinction. Uh, people with intermediate social rank were buried with just a small leaf of metal in the mouth. And the great lords, like those that have been discovered uh, in some of the uh, larger burial complexes, had hundreds of these pieces amongst their offerings. The Moche were also known for their really beautiful and intricate uh, paintings that they would do as large murals on their temple complexes. So here's a close up, for example, of one of those murals from uh, the Huaca de la Luna. They were also known for their fine line drawing on ceramics. So here you see an example of a vase here. And if you look at what those two gentlemen are doing, well, they <laughs> appear to be fighting, which brings me to the next sort of thing that the Mocha are known for. They're known actually, uh, you know, uh, to uh, have painted quite a bit of violence on their vessels, um, particularly they painted things to do with sacrifice as well. So sacrifice was a common characteristic of many of the different um, uh, American civilizations. Uh, sacrificial victims, uh, as depicted on these art forms, were often killed with a knife or clubbed to death. Their bodies were dismembered, uh, their faces flayed and tossed into a heap or, or left unburied. And here you see some poor fellow getting stabbed right in the head. So as we move south from the Moche down the Andean coast to the next two cultural groups that I wanna talk about, the Paracas and the Nazca, um, one of the things that you would notice would be that it was much drier. Southern Peru is much drier, and as a consequence, we believe that the population density of the indigenous groups to the south was much smaller than the north. The small villages that um, began to appear in that region um, depended much more on fishing and farming together. In some ways, that region really um, is a desert. Uh, but because it has such a rich ocean and because we still have those river valleys where you can grow things like cotton, then that can support civilization. Uh, so 
I want to first talk about the Paracas culture because it is the earlier of the uh, of the three cultures. In fact, Paracas culture begins around 800 to 100 BCE. Most of the information that we know about the lives of these people comes from excavations on the Paracas Peninsula. Uh, and you can see sort of a close up of the map on the bottom there to give you a rough idea of where the Paracas Peninsula is. The, these um, different settlements may have formed a loose confederation. Uh, but like all of the other regions we've looked at, there wasn't any real major unification. It was still uh, independent chiefdoms, in essence. One of the interesting characteristics about the Paracas, and also perhaps a consequence of the incredibly dry environment in which they lived, was that they practiced mummification. And so in that, they have um, very much in common with the Egyptians in Africa. Um, they also practiced um, uh, a form of head binding. Um, now, head binding uh, is where a baby's skull is wrapped very tight with a cloth or something else. Uh, when it's soft, when babies are first born, their skulls are soft because their sk skulls haven't yet fused yet to become their hard um, final shape. And if you do that at just the right age, then you can essentially purposely deform the skull. Um, and this seems to have been a cultural practice for both the Paracas and the Nazca. And I'm going to explain a little bit further in just a moment. So here's an example of Paracas mummification. So um, a high ranking person, this would have been the type of um, uh, treatment that you would expect your body to be given when you passed on. So um, the body would be put in a, a fetal position and you'd be wrapped with fine clothing, expensive dress, you'd have jewelry, all the things that would rank you as a person of high social status. And then they would create essentially a fabric tomb using ponchos and and other cloths and embroidered and and all a very very expensive and all of that would be wrapped together and given the incredibly incredibly dry um, environment it's amazing the degree of preservation that we have found uh, in these mummies that have been um, looked at by archaeologists uh, to this day so here is that skull um, deforming that I was talking about that was uh, that was practiced by Paracas and they weren't the only people around the world who have who have uh, practiced this at, at, at certain times. Um, but this seems to have been an element of status. So again, the way that it would be done is when a baby was born before their um, before their skull fused and became hard, it would be wrapped tightly with cloth. Now we don't know entirely what the long-term health effects would be of having this done to you. Um, but it has been theorized that the health effects wouldn't have been as bad as you might think they would have been, and that you, that they might have been able to live normal lives despite the fact of having very unusual looking skulls. Uh, so this probably would have been associated with the nobility within Paracas culture. So it wouldn't have necessarily been something that all people would have, have been done, but only people of a very high rank would have had it done. And so we've arrived at the last culture that I want to introduce you to today, and that is the Nazca culture. The Nazca civilization flourished on the southern coast of Peru between 200 BCE and 600 CE. And so as such, they were contemporary with the Paracas culture and then ultimately outlasted the Paracas culture. Um, and they're very, very similar. Obviously, uh, they were influenced um, by the Paracas culture, but the Nazca, they are distinctive in their own right. So they're known for this very distinctive pottery and textiles. Um, they, again, like all the other peoples we've met pretty much uh, today, uh, were not unified, but rather loosely aligned with one another. Their villages were built on terraced hillsides. And again, in their incredibly dry, arid environment, they had to make use, extensive use of irrigation tunnels and also building even underground reservoirs to hold water for dry seasons. Like the Paracas, they also practiced uh, mummification of their dead. Uh, this is an image um, from uh, a, a really haunting image, one of many that you can see at the 
uh, Twashila Cemetery, which was discovered in the desert in the 1920s, and it hadn't been used uh, since probably about the 9th ninth century um but the cemetery had um probably been used for a period of about 600 or 700 years while it was in use um and probably started to be used around the year 200 ce and again the bodies are in a remarkable state of preservation now what the nazca are known for more than anything of all is uh their large um, uh, geoglyphs which are made in the soil of the Nazca Desert in southern Peru and this is probably how you have heard about them before so let's take a look at what I mean so the Nazca lines really have to be seen from the air to truly appreciate just how beautiful and how complex they are they were created between uh, 500 BCE and uh, 500 CE um, uh, by the Nazca people, um, perhaps by other people as well, making um, depressions or shallow incisions in the desert ground. They're, what they would do is they would essentially remove the pebbles and they would leave uh, different colored dirt exposed. And so in doing so, they create these geographic shapes um, and some of them are absolutely humongous. Um, there are uh, three basic types of Nazca lines that have been created. There are just simply straight lines, geometric designs, and then there's pictorial representations like the monkey that you see here. There are over 800 straight lines on the coastal plain, some of which are, if you can believe it, 48 kilometers long. Additionally, there are some 300 geometric designs which include basic shapes such as triangles, rectangles, and trapezoids, as well as spirals, arrows, zigzags, etc., uh, etc. Et um, the, the more common ones, the ones that we probably hear about more often, they're representations of about 70 different animals and plants, some of which measure up to 370 meters long, such as spiders, hummingbirds, a cactus plant, a monkey, whale, llama, duck, flower tree, lizard, and dog. So the big question is why did they do these? Well, of course, if you've heard of them, you probably heard about them on maybe um, you know Ancient Aliens or some other ridiculous uh, history TV show, which really isn't a history show. The History Channel produces these things. I don't know why, but anyway, um, they are almost certainly have nothing to do with aliens. Human beings created them for very human reasons. Um, there have been a variety of theories uh, about uh, why they were created, probably as messages to their gods. Perhaps um, they were meant to also be walked in prayer. Um, uh, they uh, could have also served a purpose in terms of uh, their uh, belief in the importance of water and their whole systems of irrigation that they built in that respect they become representational of the canals which bring life into their communities so there is almost certainly a variety of human reasons that these things were created um, but of course we don't know we don't know for sure why they were created and they are yet still incredibly beautiful things to see uh, here is a spider one, and here is perhaps uh, an artist um, imagining how these things might have been created with groups of people working in teams, removing the top layer of rocks to expose the different colored sand underneath. And because this environment is so dry, and because this environment changes so little over time, this desert, um, they are still largely preserved to this day. So let's put it all together, what we've been talking about. So we've talked about early civilizations in Africa and in the Americas. What we can say is that in both places, we see very similar patterns of agricultural development, similar spread of villages. Uh, we see a similar emergence of chieftains and the rise of kingdoms. And we see also that very similar pattern of also disunity and that they are often based on rivers what also is quite remarkable is that the these are independent developments they're happening by themselves in different completely different places on the world and yet they're following the same very human pattern and so this is 
one of those intersections of world history that we want to be paying attention to. By the time we reach 600 BCE, we pretty much have gotten to the point where everywhere on the planet, farming and village life has transformed lives uh, for everywhere where that is a viable option. And so as we now move forward, we will start to see the emergence of empires. We're really going to see um, how a unity becomes much more of the norm rather than disunity. We're also going to see the growth of world religions. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the lecture podcast. In our next lecture podcast for Intersections of World History, we're going to be going back to Europe. We're going to be looking at some of the great empires of the ancient world, the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, and the Chinese Empire. We're also going to see the development of some of the great world religions, namely Christianity and Buddhism. All that to come next week on Intersections of World History.